Goedemorgen aan al die wagyu deelers en belangstellenden. Ik wil graag met die gesels van ogen oor die genomische inlichting als een hulpmiddel om die afgeraadheid van selectie te kan verhoog. In today's discussion, we'll ask the question, why a genomic focus? We'll look at genomic info as an additional tool, and then briefly look at the Wagyu pipeline for using genomic information with some concluding remarks. So, waarom die genomische focus? Is dit nou die gebruik woordelijke flavor of the month? Of is hier die technologie waar in ons een lang termijn belegging behoor te maak? En kort is genomica inlichting wat voor ons een beter begrip gee van die genetische samenstelling van, ou, van ons dieren. Ons kan ons dieren sy genetische diversiteit bestudeer, ons kan genomische inteling bereken, ons gebruik dit om enkel geen defecte op te spoor, ouderskap op te los, En natuurlijk ook wil ons baie graag meer weet rondom die geen functies van sekere eigenschappen. So we apply genomic information for our animal health, welfare traits, product quality and overall improvement of production efficiency. Does that mean that we discard our phenotypes? Nee, glad nie. Genomische inlichting? is niet een vervanging voor accurate fenotypering nie. Dit bly steeds van uiterste belang dat ons behoorlijke dieren aantekening sal doen. Dit is die eerste stap vir u op die plaas vir objektieve meting en objektieve selectie. So genomische inlichting is maar slechts een additionele hulpmiddel wat ons kan gebruik. So die gesegde phenotype remains king is beslisbaar en verder ook sê a uh, trekker, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, accurate fenotypes van alle eigenschappen van belang bly belangrijk en kort hou ons bij die basisse beginsels van kwantitatieve genetika om onze uh, selectieprogramme saam te stel. Just a little bit of history. If we look at this animal breeding and genetic timeline, we see these two distinguished gentlemen here on the photos, and these are Jay Lush and Hazel, which are recognized as the fathers of quantitative genetics. They coined the concepts such as heritability, genetic correlations, selection theory that we are still using today. On this timeline, they starting 1918 up to 2009. You see my 2009 being bold because this is the year when we can say that we've actually entered the era of genomics. Molecular technology was starting to develop by the late 1980s, early 90s, with developments in PCR technology for DNA duplication and SANA sequencing. And a lot of these developments we can thank the Human Genome Project for because a lot of money and funds were invested in the completion of the Human Genome by 2003. And along with all these technology developments, genome mappings, DNA marker discovery followed and also then the completion of the bovine genome in 2009. DNA markers, en ek gaan net vir u verwijs kortliks na die twee markers wat vir ons van meeste waarde is, namelijk die microsatellite en die SNP markers. Net om het in perspektief te sit, DNA markers is een specifieke fragment van DNA wat bij een specifieke locus uh, aanwezig is, waar daar twee kopieën van elke alleel is, en dan wat als gevolg van die alleelische verschillen voor ons dan oorsprong gee in variatie. Ons soek na hoogspolymorfische loki, 
want dit geeft ons die variatie wat ons nodig heeft voor selectie. En in die klein sketsie daar is dat twee homoloe chromosome wat vir jy mooi illustreer waar le die um, gene by die spesifieke lookie en dan ook wees wat is die verskil tussen een homosigotiese um, lookie vir een dominante allele soos byvoorbeeld daar met die P aangedui die homosigotis recessief en dan een jetrisigotiese voorbeeld. In this figure, specifically it shows us the difference between what we call short tandem repeat or SDR markers and single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNP markers. Now the SDRs shown there in the uh, orange um, bar shows a fragment of DNA which have specific repetitions and this portion of repeats is, is a, it's a unique fragment which occurs in over across the um, chromosomes and we use this unique set that remains the same as a marker. While in the case of the single nucleotide, the differences we see is only at one specific nucleotide compared to the STRs which we recognize in within specific fragments. And all of these uh, markers um, that indicate differences among animals contribute to genetic variation. So genomics as an additional tool, what do we do with this? Specifically, the two DNA markers mostly used in uh, livestock genomics. It includes the microsatellite markers and single nucleotide polymorphic markers. Now, tot nou toe het ons baie gebruik gemaakt van microsatelliet markers, want hulle was relatief bekostigbaar. En ook hier in Zuid-Afrika het ons die technologie gehad om makkelijk met hulle te kon werk. Eerst met die begin van die commerciële uh, SNP panele het ons begin beweeg na wat ons noem die SNP um, reis of SNP panele. Nou die voordeel van die SNP merker is dat het een hoë dichtheidsmerker is en geef ons uit die aard van die saak meer inlichting en dit is meer koste en tijdseffectief weens die feit dat ons hoë deersit genotypering met hierdie merkers kan doen. In hierdie skype het ek vir microsatelliet merkers en SNP merkers teen oor mekaar probeer vergelijk, waar die microsatelliet een kort herhalende DNA volgorde is, wat vir jou die verskille tussen die individue uitwees, en baie goed gebruik kan word vir diversiteit en ouderskap, as ook forensiese navorsing, waar die SNP net een enkele basispaar is, wat by een specifieke positie verskil, gee met ander woorde vir my minder inlichting as die microsatelliet merker, maar omdat ek met duisende van hierdie SNP merkers tot my beskikking het, omdat hulle het recht dier die genoem voorkom, het ons op die ou, dan, ou en dan baie meer inlichting as wat ek met een microsatelliet merker paneel werk wat beperk is. So hoe gebruik ons DNA merkers? Microsatellieten en SNPs is baie um, uh, gebruikersvriendelik vir identificatie van enkel geen eigenskappe wat natuurlijk ook genetische defekte insluit. Um, ook eigenskap is soos die Puna um, uh, eigenskap, hoorings of nie, hoorings nie, uh, wat ons met die Celtic toets doen. Um, ons kan iets soos uh, haar kleur kan ons bepaal en dan ook in die volgende skyf het ek vir een aantal genetische defekte wat ook met die markers geïdentificeerd kan word. Ons kan ook hoofgene of sogenoemde mysogenes Dit is soos myostatin wat dubbel bespiering veroorzaak. Dit is ook moendlik om met SNPs die myostatin variante te kan identificeer. 
Parentage testing, microsats are still used in some countries, including South Africa, but slowly but surely the world is moving towards um, SNPs due to the more routine genotyping and the uptake of genomic selection in most of the world, first world countries. Population genetic studies are more of an academic value, but most useful for us as researchers as it gives us insight into diversity of populations, inbreeding, and what we call admixture, so we can identify breed composition using these markers and also phylogenetic structures and breed origin. Here is a tabel van a paar van die genetische defecte waarvoor getits kan word met die behulp van um, SNP uh, panele. En ek het ook vir paar gelijs wat dan nou specifiek op betrekking met die WAGURAS het. As ons kyk na ouwerskap bepaling met die gebruik van een microsatelliet merke, dan het ons gewoonlik so tussen 12 en 18 markers nodig. En is duidelik van hierdie sketsie dat die alleel D daar in die nageslag afkomstig is van die vaar 1 en dat die H alleel dan van die moeder afkomstig was. So daar is geen manier hoe die sogenaamde vaar 2 daar met die E en die I alleel die vader vir hierdie specifieke dier kon gewees. If we use SNPs for parentage, we evaluate all the potential sire alleles and we will also have available dam alleles and which will then be compared and accurate parentage can be done because we are comparing the alleles from the different SNPs across the genome with everything that is available in the specific database when we have access to routine genotypes. Dit gesê, moet ons dan kyk na die gebruik van die microsatelliet teen oor die SNP en wat is dan die situasie op die huidige oomlik as ons een merkerpaneel gebruik met net microsatelliet merkers. Die panele is gewoonlik so 12 tot 18 merkers met een relatieve makkelijke um, procedure in die laboratorium. Die beperking vorm in as ons met rasse werk wat moendlik ingeteel is of wat klein populaties is. Microsatellite het die neiging om te meteer met ander woorde wat ek vandag op die um, um, apparaat aflees as 122 alleel basispaar mag ook in een volgende in analyse 121 wees. Dus ook die rede hoekom daar standaarde gebruik word by al die laboratoriums wat voldoen aan die standaard van die International Society for Animal Genetics. Die um, word hou ook elke uh, drie jare congres waar daar dan workshops is waar die panele vir ouwerskap geverifieer word en allemaal saam stem oor die standaarde. Die probleem dan nou met die microsatelliet is op die stadium, dat alhoewel dit vir ons relatief bekostigbaar is, soos wat technologie verouder en ons het in stand moet hou, um, mag dit dan in die toekomst nie meer die beste optie wees um, om microsatellieten te kan gebruik nie. Die SNP um, inlichting is definitief bezig om um, veld te wen en hier is ook weer eens een paneel beskikbaar. Hier is die paneel so tussen 100 en 200. Die aanvankelijke 100 paneel is nou opgegradeer na 200 merkers toe en gedierig word al gekyk om te sien hoeveel merkers is nodig om die uh, ouderskap akkuraat op te loos. Als routine genotype pering gebruik word, dan gebruik mens al die um, beskikbare data dan om die ouderskap nie op te los. Dit is ongelukkig nie altyd moendlik as al die dieren in die populatie nie van routine genotypering gebruik maak nie. 
So, op hierdie stadium is dit nog weer vir sy Oost-Afrikaanse telers om van hierdie kleiner panele te gebruik. Um, maar soos wat routine genotypering plaas vind vir uh, telers wat begin genomische selectie gebruik, sal ons heel moeilijk dan eerder snip panele gebruik vir ouderskap oplossing en stelselmatig wegbeweek van die uh, microsatellite. Die uitdaging is natuurlijk bij ons internationale rasse he, waar die lande van waar ons bijvoorbeeld semen wil van invoer, dat hulle reeds snip om nele gebruik um, en nie meer microsatellite. So dit is een van die uitdagings wat ons in die volgende jaar of twee sal moet oorkom, versekere van ons internationale rasse. Ek kan nie vir genoeg probeer oortuig dat uh, akkerate stamboom absoluut uh, belangrijk en uh, essentieel is nie. As ons net kyk na hierdie klein bykie navorsing, ek het net soos drie studies hier gekies om hier te wees, dat dit is die beraamde fout wat insluip, selfs in melkweeste kan daar een foutkie insluip met ouderskap uh, waar een nommer verkeerd neergeskryf word of een strooikie word verkeerd uit de vlees gehaal. En daarom is het belangrijk dat ons gebruik maak van een beproefde toets soos DNA gebaseerde ouderskap bepaling om seker te maak dat ons stambome correct is. We have done some studies at the University of Pretoria where we have um, tested parentage in um, South Africa and Angora and found up to 25% um, errors in um, parentage. And when we did a follow-up study where we linked this to EBV estimations, we actually found significant re-rankings. So, Incorrect parentage results in overall loss in genetic progress. So what about the Wagyu and access to genomics? Now, routine genotyping is obviously available for Wagyu, and I know that Wagyu breeders are already engaging in making use of SNP genotyping. It is important, important for your parentage verification, identifying animals, with which are potential carriers of the genetic defects and then also for genomic selection. Parentage testing at the moment with microsatellites are obviously still uh, affordable and we will have to stay ahead with new technology and with a complete genotype we will have access to the complete set of benefits but obviously Cost is something that we still need to consider. Commercial laboratories in South Africa where genotyping can be done. I've listed the three main private laboratories um, and then also the ARC biotech platform for SNP genotyping. But Inkawa and Unistel are probably the two labs that offers most of the animal related services. The process for genomic testing is the same as the process that we use for genomic selection. And just to show you that we start on farm, we take a biological sample. It needn't be a blood sample. We've moved away from blood samples to hair samples and also in a breed such as the Wagyu where traceability is important or if ID tags are used where you already have your biological sample when identification takes place and the DNA will go to the specific lab, um, extraction is done and a SNP array of choice is performed and at the moment most of our cattle breeds are using the new uh, uh, Illumina 50k or GeneSeq uh, products. The genomic information goes back to your service provider, which can provide you with correct parentage, um, the genetic defects that you have interest for, or, or myostatin variants, whatever 
is re uh, required by your breed society and then where we have proper reference populations in place and accurate phenotyping so that we can enhance your estimated breeding value with genomic information. The farmer will receive genomic um, enhanced breeding values for selection. This is just the pipeline and you should be familiar with this as Wagyu breeders that shows the um, process from where the breeder starts to complete the laboratory request form um, for the sampling and the DNA sample will then be barcoded, will go to the LRF office and to the service provider for the DNA extraction and results will after analysis be provided back to the society in the form of a SNP profile and back to the farmer in terms of these uh, genomic tools that I have referred to. So in conclusion, genomics can be a very useful tool for increasing the accuracy of selection. This duidelik that us ons gebruik maak van genomische inlichting het sy microsatelliet markers of SNP markers dat ons die akkuraatheid van ons stamboome verhoog. Met SNP markers gaan ons een hoer akkuraatheid kry as wanneer ons net microsatellite gebruik. Dit geef vir hierdie geleentheid om daar die draar dieren van een genetische defect te kan identificeer en te bestuur. Uh, dit geef vir ons geleentheid om inteling in die kudde te bestuur. Een verdere Ek wil sê, as ek die woord mag gebruik, spin of is natuurlijk genomische seleksie. Want daar genomische informatie, as die routine genotypering gaan doen, gaan gebruik kan word in die seleksie met die, uh, aangezien die dan een GEBB gaan ontvang. En dit is belangrijk vir die eigenskappe wat laag erfbaarheid het en ook moeilik is om te meet. So bijvoorbeeld die kwaliteitseigenskappe, karkas eigenskappe, um, vrugbare, dis die eigenskappe wat ons moeilik um, meet, uh, dis moeilik defineerbaar, dis, dis komplekse eigenskappe en hier hou genomische inlichting die meeste voordeel in om vir ons op die lang termijn dan um, die akkuraatheid van ons seleksie ook daar te verhoog. En natuurlijk vir een ras soos die Wagyu, is na speerbaarheid vir die product baie belangrik en nog een verdere rede waar genomische inlichting een bijdrage maak. Should you invest in genomics? Yes, I think so. If I can solve parentage for my animals, if I can identify carrier animals, if traceability will add value to the end product. These are all positive for investing in genomics. Obviously breeders need to investigate all options for testing. As technology develops and more of us can also engage and invest, it will become more affordable. Genomics, definitely a long-term investment. Uh, it's part of precision farming and I do believe an essential tool for increasing the accuracy of selection. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hi, that was that. Um, any questions at this stage? Um, I can try to answer your questions and then um, if Mr. Thais Meyer is here, he can start with his presentation, but you can now um, ask um, some question if, uh, questions if you like. Um, so yeah, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself.
Any questions? Michael, is there something that you want to add at this stage before um, Mr. Tay starts with his presentation? Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. No, thanks, uh, Izan. I think Esti did a, quite a good job there. It's always about the cost um, of uh, doing this technology. And um, at the moment, it costs about uh, seven, eight hundred rand. Um, if you use uh, the laboratories that are currently available uh, per SNP, and I uh, also want Tase to, if I can get hold of him, to talk about the, um, the beef genomics project, why it's so important to us, so that we can migrate the whole industry away from uh, what we call microsatellites, MIPS, um, to uh, SNPs and uh, to start making it affordable. Most industries internationally have moved across to genomics. Now use uh, SNPs uh, as the method of choice for, um, for parentage. They use it as the method of uh, choice for, um, for selection. And uh, I see Tais is now lining up there. Uh, so we in South Africa in this year, Within this year, what we see if we can't uh, migrate the industry uh, away from uh, what is now becoming an old-fashioned tool called a microsatellite to a to a SNP, and um, see if we can migrate the industry uh, completely. And uh, this has been a, a long program. This has been round one of uh, the B Genomics project started in, if I'm correct, 2015, I think, and uh, finished 2018, and we hope to get 2020 going this year. And we hope that this year, after a five-year program, uh, to migrate the industry. So uh, a lot of this work has been uh, a team effort, but a uh, leader of that team has been uh, Thais. So it's uh, nice for us to introduce Thais to be able to give this part of the presentation. Morning, Tais. I might just unmute him. He's on. Tais is live, is he? Or is this just his screen? Um, he is live. Okay. 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 Can you hear me now? We can yes, thanks, Thais. Uh, okay. A warm welcome, not a warm welcome, a cold welcome to South Africa, Thais. We've got a big cold front coming through the country. And, um, and I think everybody who's got a heater has got it on today. Well, here in, um, in the Middle East, in Riyadh, it's a nice sunny day, so we can't complain. We've got lots to be grateful for. Um, thanks for the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to jump into it. I'm going to talk to you about, as you can see on the screen, uh, the LRF breeds and the approach we take to BGP. Uh, and very specifically, uh, I'll start um, initially just giving you a bit of a glimpse of the difference in our approach in round one to the approach we intend to take in round two. And then we'll go through all the different aspects and then I will end up with a significantly important part of BGP, which um, has been added to the scope of BGP through our cooperation with ARC, and that is the KYD program. Um, how do I get this thing to go to the next page? There we are. So BGP-1 was a population-wide progeny improvement scheme. And when I say this, I need to clearly differentiate. This is the way the LRF breeds implemented. So LRF used the opportunity during the first phase of BGP-1 to get the participating breed societies to significantly improve their participation in progeny improvement and in measurement of data, how to measure it, what to measure. We spent very little, if any, funding that was received on genotyping or SNPs. 
it was not a high priority for us. The stud book breeds followed a different approach. Quite rightfully, they were, especially the Bons Maras, were at a different point in terms of their technology deployment. But be that as it may, within the LRF breeds, we didn't do a lot of snips. And obviously, each breed society had its own approach. Some breed societies did more. The Brahmin, particularly, did, a, did quite a bit more uh, genotyping, but many of the other breed societies within the LRF focused on progeny improvement and how to start collecting data and very specifically difficult to measure traits. In BGP2, we will follow the following strategy or we recommend to breed societies to, to consider the following strategy. Firstly, a breed strategy with a clear understanding of what traits are important to measure and to, to deliver on the strategy. And just to give you an example, it's pretty obvious that a breed like the Wagyu is very focused on meat quality and carcass quality, whereas some of the other breeds may have different focuses. So it's very important that a breed strategy is developed and it's clear in order to roll out that strategy, what is it that you want to measure? And when we say measure, we mean the phenotype, not the genotype. The genotype will follow, but in principle, the phenotype. Then you need to identify a number of stud herds, which is practicing total testing. And we'll get back to the concept of total testing a bit later, but you've got to get those guys and identify them. It's normally, 10 to 15 percent of the total number of studs in a specific breed. It's not bigger than that. It's a fairly normal uh, distribution, if you could call it that. It's the same for all breed societies. So you shouldn't knock yourself if you don't have more than 10 to 15 percent of breeders that are prepared to do total testing. Those breed studs that's been identified, you need to promote amongst them to consider uh, a, an approach whereby the contemporary groups that are generated uh, of the same sex animals are bigger than 10 of a large variety of bulls and large, definitely more than one. Um, and it remains the uh, within a contemporary group, but the contemporary groups uh, uh, across the total number of participating herds, a large variety. And it's totally the individual's choice. Which bull does he use? In other words, the bull, the bull that he use works for him. And then the important part with linkage sires. And again, those group of breeders that uh, work together to establish this reference population, make it easy and make it simple. Those number of breeders pick that sire, that linkage sire. And they create mechanisms among themselves to create that linkage, whether it be through AI or through swapping bulls or whatever they do, there's various strategies that one could follow. But the significant important here is get the contemporary groups robust, get the contemporary groups such that they contain offspring of more than one animal, and create excellent linkage between those contemporary groups. So you could immediately um, see that it's difficult to do that across the complete breed, but it's possible to do it amongst a smaller number of breeders. Then you've got to maintain linkage between the test groups. In other words, from year to year or from season to season. Then uh, it sounds simple, but it's very important consistent measurement discipline and sound practices throughout we will touch on it a little bit later but the fact is if you don't know what you're measuring and you don't make sure that you measure the same way every time and that you measure accurately every time and then you will find uh, data with less quality ensuring sufficiently large management groups for all traits measured um, it's just a practical fact that some traits are measured early in the life of the animal and some traits are only measured later in the life of the animal. 
And the challenge is normally to get those management groups large enough for those traits that are measured later in life. And let's pick a typical example. Quite a number of breeders stand up and say, but I do measure scrotal circumference. And then when you start asking him, what was the management group construction when you used it? You, you lose the breeder just there when you ask that question. But the practical fact is all measurements we take are compared with their siblings or with the uh, other animals inside the management group. And if you don't have that comparison, that measurement means nothing. So taking the scrotal circumference of a bull that was fed individually because he had other merits actually is of very little value from a genetical perspective. Duration required to collect sufficient data for female fertility. Female fertility, we'll get to it later again, remains a significantly important aspect to focus on in any beef improvement scheme. And uh, it requires quite a bit of patience. It, take, it happens later in life of the animal. So that duration in terms of participation is required. Avoiding of selection bias. We all humans, we all uh, have a favor for some animals and, uh, to others. Uh, the practical fact is when you tackle genomics, you actually want to also identify those that you don't like for whatever good reason the one that is structurally not as sound as it should be. You want that genomic profile of that animal as well, because you need to try and in the future, try and identify the link between the genomic profile and this animal that actually doesn't fit the future of the breed, because maybe you'll be able to in future create a, a linkage and then use genomics to do better selection. So selection bias is actually, or the avoidance thereof is actually significantly important. And then uh, throughout the process, the avoidance of group effects and group test effects, one's got to make sure that the, the various tests are always linked through linkage sires with each other, that group effects and group test effects are avoided. If we then move on to the pillars of a sustainable genomic program, and this is from the genomic side of things. We started at the top uh, with the previous page as well. A breed society needs to find its own plan and the alternatives, and it's in consideration of its breed strategy. Then that breed society starts with an initial, on the left, with an initial reference population representing the diversity of the population. In other words, in this case, it's simply a matter of, and there's scientists available that can do this very uh, elegantly, um, identifying which were the animals in your breed that had a significant influence. Irrespective of how much data were gathered of them, they were influentials. And those influentials, typically, if you get to uh, the 50th one on the list that there is DNA available for, you, you normally have a significantly large portion of your breed's uh, genetic profile available, but you need to build that gen genomic reference in terms of influentials. And for most breeds, you need to fill that up with access to international genotypes of the breed. Many breeds use international influence uh, for whatever good reason, um, and if you could get hold of genotype information or DNA material for those international um, genotypes, then it strengthens your reference population or the point of departure of your reference population, I should rather say. Then you have to have strategies in the middle, read across from other breeds, links to international reference population. You've got to uh, then, at some point in time, the scientist that is supporting you in terms of running, a, 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 a delivering on the EBVs and the GEBVs and the single step model, they will use those results to see how good do they fit with the phenotype data, the so-called training of the genomic results, 
and the validation of the genomic predictions used. So generally, those uh, mathematical models are well developed, but the fact of the matter is they take a lot of time and effort, the scientists normally, they generally say they need 1,000 to 1,500 animals with data, and that means animals with good phenotype data and genomic data uh, before they feel comfortable that the prediction equations that they use and the mathematical models that they set up are actually accurate. And that's what those last two um, elements are about. And then last but not the least, because genetic progress is a continuous thing, uh, one needs to continuously refresh or update the reference population to ensure that the genomic prediction equations remain valid for the current population. And that's significantly important. In other words, it needs to become a way of life. At the bottom, as a foundation, the own population phenotype database for all traits, including the difficult to measure traits, difficult to measure traits and the maternal traits. In other words, that remains the foundation of any genomics program, good phenotype data. If we then look at, and it looks like the same heading, it is actually the same heading, but this is about the humans, the people, within this system that is getting this job done. The strategic management and ownership by the society is of significant importance. The ability of your society to execute on program management, to set up international collaboration, to work with your service providers for applied research and to gain their support in terms of the progress that you make and the usefulness of the data that you collected. A society culture of continuous improvement. And as a foundation, a core of breeders committed to total performance testing and international competitiveness. I'm pretty sure we are all aware of the basic fact that a breed and the progress a breed makes is 100% dependent on the commitment of the breeders and their ability to work together as a team. This is what this slide is about. Is there such a commitment and is there as ability in the bigger team uh, perspective to, to make that progress? We spoke about total testing and just to put it into context, some of you might have seen the slide before. It's a slide that, uh, in my perception, uh, always need to be spoken about. Uh, typically, and there will be various different views on the percentage allocation of the different elements, but most, if not all animal scientists will agree, fertility is 50% or 50% plus of any focus in terms of breeding improvement. And then if you go and do the calculations of how do you actually make money out of beef breeding or cattle breeding, you will find that anything that affects efficiency makes up the, the next 25% typically. And then if you want to start differentiating in terms, terms of getting a premium for your product, you could go and look at quality. And what do you need to do to get the premium to improve the quality? But if you didn't have a base of fertility and efficiency, then the quality in itself doesn't help you a lot. And then strangely enough, the one that we always focus on, that's the easiest to measure, all the various growth aspects, is from a genetic perspective, really contributing the least in terms of the value perspective of how to get it there. Because you know what, if you had a live calf that you got weaned properly and you fed it efficiency and it provided you good quality beef, then uh, it's not that important whether it grew slightly better or, more, or, less, or, or worse than its comp companion. Uh, but if you didn't have the others uh, and you only had a, a calf that had the potential to grow, 
but it uh, its mother only carved once in every third year, or it at three times more than its companions, or it provided the toughest beef out there, then maybe from a value perspective, it wasn't such a good calf. So that's what this logic is saying. There's a balance, there's a clear balance, there should be a clear focus. And this actually directs any breed improvement scheme, or then in this case, BGP, in terms of what are we supposed to focus on? And if you now start looking at those aspects that we suggest needs to be measured suddenly it becomes quite a bit more difficult and as you can see once you've done all of these then only do we say we want the genomic profile of the animal not a genomic profile of the animal without the phenotype data a genomic profile of the animal after the phenotype data what is good data? This is uh, tip sheets that are shared with our service provider by our service provider breed plan. It defines comparable data as data that were measured. You measured the same trait in similar external conditions without the presence of external factors affecting the expression of the me me measured trait. That is a very elegant description of make sure you understand the data is comparable. Interrogate the outliers. Calibrate your yardstick. Make sure that you treat all animals the same and measure them the same. Make sure that there's sufficient variation in the data. Avoid bias, whether it's selection bias or measurement bias or selective measurements. Any one of those elements of bias. Provide the participants an equal opportunity to perform and minimize the fragmentation of groups in practice on the farm. Management groups is something that um, should be in every lecture as Breeding 101. In my mind, if this is not taught as a basic introduction, introductory principle to anybody that wants to consider stud breeding then I believe there's something wrong with the course but the fact is you've got to understand how to manage your cows and your heifers and your bull calves uh, the management strategy specifically for each one of them the cows you've got a birth management group and you've got a post birth management group for heifers You've got a, a, a heifer management group and a strategy there too. And for bull calves, you must uh, have a management group of how to you treat that. And if you read through all of these and you consider what we've just discussed, you will find that each one of these management groups are structured such to strengthen the performance groups that are established when you do the measurements and to make sure that the data is even more robust. What, and this is another tip sheet from Breed Plan, um, what makes animals different? When should you separate one management group from the next? When there was sickness, when some animals were fed for a show or a sale, grain fed animals versus animals reared in a paddock, some animals giving growth stimulants, animals reared in different paddocks in which the feed is diff of different nutritional value. A bull has been fighting and clearly lost weight prior to recording. Yelling bulls use the sires com compared to those not use the sires. Different stages of pregnancy for heifers. heifers. Spayed heifers as compared to non-spayed heifers. It's not a practice used in South Africa a lot. Calves weighed on different scales. Calves weighed straight from the paddock as compared to those off feed for three hours or more. Importantly, if you're not sure, probably it's in a different group. But even though, if you're in doubt, ask, rather get advice, but do not just take the easy way out and group everything together and call it one management group because you're doing yourself a tremendous disfavor. Let's jump to what is effective data. And this is just a, 
the representation of a simple mathematical calculation showing what is the effect of group size in terms of the usefulness of the data, the effectiveness of the data. If there are 10 calves of the same sex, I'm starting with the with left-hand columns, 10 calves of the same sex, and there are two sires represented, then 90%, that data is 90% effective. But for the sire EBVs, to learn anything from the sire EBVs, the data is only 50%. Why 50%? Because you're comparing one with another. If you immediately jump to 12 calves, now suddenly you'll see the sire EBVs become 67% because you are comparing one to two others. And you can see in the next two columns, the sire EBVs with four different sires present, you're comparing three, one against three others, and so forth. So it's a simple calculation to show that if you want to gain value out of the data, then you've got to get the number of calls in the group big, and you've got to get the number of sires represented in the group big as well, but you've got to have a balance because you've got to have the number of calves from each sire large simultaneously. So you can see from this the improvement from having 10 calves to the, in the management group versus 20 calves in the management group. The comparison on the calf level only moved from 90% to 95%, but comparing the balls suddenly the value of the data increased from 50% to in the 80%. Uh, and that is the big difference that you want to gain out of there because in the end we breed with the bulls and we want to learn as much as possible from the bulls we breed with as early as possible. Data that was uh, presented by Rob Banks originally earlier this year, he uh, shared this data um, during a discussion with the Harifits in Australia and they did an analysis <clears throat> and what is the effect on the heritability of a trait, the non-genetic effect comparing poor recording practices with good recording practices. In other words, what the scientists are saying is guys, by just improving your recording practices, you actually improve the heritability of the trait that you are measuring. And it sounds strange initially, but think about it, because in the end, the scientists are using the data that we measure, and based on that, they calculate the heritability. And if we've got better data, then we end up with improved heritability because they can actually explain a larger portion of the variation because it's better data. That's as simple as that. And if we look at the row with the example in there, you can clearly see that the difference between poor recording and good recording is 25%. And the effect it has on accuracy of EBVs is the difference between a 33% and a 50% increase or relative accuracy for that specific example. And you can see now that was just an example trait. The others are real traits. The fact of the matter is one could improve the EBV accuracy significantly by simply improving your recording practices. And we spoke earlier about all the different elements of the recording practices, which was management groups and linkage and non-bias and all those other things that we touched on. A general graph that was <clears throat> generated, I think more than 20 years ago by Ben Hayes and Mike Goddard, which suggested that for a reference population, you need to have a large number of genome types, depending on the heritability of the trait that you're talking of, 
to improve the accuracy of the unphenotyped animal. As you can see there, the numbers we're talking of running into thousands. Uh, at the right hand, the last figure there is 20,000. But if you don't have between two and 4,000, you're not really making a significant uh, difference in terms of what is that accuracy of the unphenotyped animal. An unphenotyped animal is an animal in which you have only got the DNA sample, you don't have any phenotype measurements, and you've now tried getting an EBV from that animal based on its genetic profile only, based on the re reference population that you've, you've created. And this then says, how big does the reference population need to be? And then we add that Rob Banks input that we discussed two slides earlier and saying but wait a minute if you take the same logic and now you improve the quality of your data then you suddenly realize that you can take those graphs and improve the heritability of your trait and because you improve the heritability of your trait you are suddenly ending up with improved accuracies so from a strategy perspective, a breed society needs to very carefully say, I must spend as much effort, if not more, in terms of improving, improving data quality than I need to spend on getting the size of my reference population as big as possible. In other words, size do not matter. Data quality matters in the reference population or data quality matters much more than size. If you've got a large reference population of data of animals with poor data, and poor data could mean that you only have one or two traits measured on the animal, or poor data could mean that you have data of animals with small management, from small management groups. Poor data could mean many things, but the fact of the matter is it's no use that you've thrown a lot of money after genotypes and you ended up with a large number of genotypes and the phenotype data supporting those genotypes are poor. That's the significantly important message provided by Rob Banks. Focus on building your reference population, but in the same time, focus on the quality of that reference population in specific words, focus on the quality of the data, the phenotype data available for that reference population. Now we jump to uh, the broader picture, genomics within B BGP on the left hand side. We understand that we've discussed that a reference population consists of that initial batch of influentials then we need those animals that we've now discussed at length with good quality phenotype data. And that has to include the difficult and expensive to measure phenotypes. And only after you've done the top three, then you consider to do the genotypes. Obviously, you need the pedigree data, which will be improved by the genomic data. And by that, we imply that. Genomics has got the ability to actually ascertain which contribution was made by which parent. And it doesn't use the standard allocation of 50% sire, 50% dad. So the pedigree data could be improved by good genomic data. And then obviously, uh, the scientists working the problem, they will create the various relationship matrix between the phenotype and the genotype. And through that whole process, uh, which they call single step, they end up with GBVs and they get prediction values based on and theoretically for the unphenotyped animal on the right hand side at the bottom, genotype only. So on the left-hand side, we've got the reference population, animals with good phenotypes. On the right-hand side, we have got the unphenotyped animal. So for that unphenotyped animal, we only have a genotype, 
It's supported by the pedigree data and in many cases measurements on relatives because mostly the relatives through the pedigree there has been some measure somewhere in the pedigree by other breeders that have got relatives of that animal. But you said with stud animals without phenotype data it's typical commercial herds or it could be commercial herds, or it could be small holes, or it could be communal herds. All of those would then benefit from improvement of prediction with improved performance recording. Yes, if they start doing that, they will greatly benefit from that. But if not, then they will still get a GEBV, which could assist them in terms of breeding decisions or selection decisions. So this is the, the basic logic of what BGP is trying to do. So just to recapture a reference population requirement, initial population of circa 50 genotypes to capture the genetic diversity, and thereafter, subsequent genotypes from animals with good phenotype data. It's as simple as that. It's not, not more complex, but Without the words good phenotype data there, please don't spend your R&D money on that genotype. If the farmer wants to do it, let him pay it out of his own pocket. Linkage. Linkage, we touched on linkage more than once, and linkage could be created through, in two cases at least, basic practices by the breeder. The first one, you can link your phenotype data through the structuring of strong management groups. And we have discussed management groups at length. So by just doing that properly, you will create linkage. Then secondly, as a breeder, you could create linkage through shared and common an an ancestors. And then lastly, it's potentially possible that once that reference population is built properly and established and the SNP profiles and the performance relationship between performance and SNP markers have been well established, one could create linkage through shared and common genetic markers. But as you could see, the last one is after the fact. The first linkage element is determined by how the breeders go about their practices. Then a very important part of BGP is KYD. Michael, before I continue, let me just check how much time do I have? Hello? Grace, you can continue. There's still, uh, still some time left. You still got about 15 okay. minutes, Dice. Okay, I'll definitely finish and finish in 15. Thank you. For a moment, I was worried that I was talking to myself. Um, we're going to move on to KYD. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're all aware, we are South Africans. And we are part of a bigger community. And for any program of this approach to be successful, we have to ensure inclusivity. KYD is a program, and don't ask me to use the correct African language uh, pronunciation of what KYD stands for, but it is a beautiful name. The fact of the matter is, it is a program that's been established and ran by the ARC for many years. And in the recent, I would say last year, there has been a meeting of minds between the ARC and the BGP program management. These two programs will be combined for the obvious benefits uh, that we both could gain from it. So to do that, we started off collectively to first understand the emerging sector. And we have identified that the emerging sector, by emerging sector, we simply imply uh, sector of those farmers that come out of the formal definition of previously disadvantaged individuals. And 
as we all are aware, there are black stud breeders today, and there are a good number of good commercial black farmers. But there is a significant number of communal livestock owners, and there's a significant number of smallholder farms. So this pie chart is not meant to be accurate. It is descriptive of identifying the four various segments. The reason why it's important is that one immediately needs to recognize that the goals, the point of departure, and the activities and outcomes and outputs for each one of these sectors in the emerging sector, or each one of the segments in the emerging sector, should be different. That's why we started off with segmentation. Then we jump to, so how do you get good genomics to make a difference to the various elements in the beef industry? So we've discussed at length, at the top, you've got that small nucleus of BGP breeders, and this goes for each breed societies individually, creating a genomics nucleus with excellent performance recording. And generally you will find in most breed societies, a good number of stud breeders, which expands that genomic database with good performance recording, not necessarily total performance recording, but still they've got a good understanding that they do it and they add good value to that genomic reference population. And thereafter you sit with quite a number of stud breeders that don't do performance recording. Some of them are excellent stud breeders. They do an excellent job. They provide what they call genetic material, uh, but those genetics are selected on phenotype principles predominantly uh, without the necessary linkage to the phenotype data and the genetics link there too. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is those animals, by the nature of how they've been selected, has not been contributing to that genomic reference population that we just spoke about. So if we now need to discuss how do we create an influence on commercial breeders and smallholder stock, stock owners, then we need to get mechanisms to get animals that has got a link into the reference populations into the commercial space and the smallholder stock space. And that's what this graph is trying to show. You cannot use all stud animals. You've got to make use of or develop strategies where animals that is specifically part of the reference population in terms of contributing there to, which in other words, their GEBV accuracy is of a high standard. Those animals will give you bigger bang for your buck when they are applied in the commercial breeder space or the smallholder stock, stock owner space. It's just a practical fact of how the data works. Now we move towards the BGP transformation goals, and this is directly part of the KYD program. We've identified four high-level areas, inclusivity, product and technology transfer, skills transfer, and we've identified that we need to focus on partnerships and synergies. And for each one of them, we have developed a strategic plan. And I'm not going to discuss all of the details here, but the fact of the matter is we looked at that high level. Of more importance is on the next two pages, we have identified for each of the four segments that we've identified, the communal sector, the emerging sector, the commercial sector, and the stud sector, we have identified project activities, outputs and deliverables, outcomes, and what is the impact that we intend to achieve. And as you can see, initially for the communal
Natais. I think we lost Thais there. Thais, can you hear me? Thais? Okay, I think we lost ties there. Is there any questions at this stage? We can just try to get him online again. Hello, can you hear me? I can you know where Thais? Sorry, I don't know what went wrong. I suddenly saw my screen said they're trying to connect me again. Okay, that's fine. You can continue. Um, okay, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. So somebody um, else is. Just, um, yeah, it's still the other. It seems as though you're on twice now, but I'm trying to stop. The other one, okay, you can try to do it now. Okay, is it working? Working. There we are, excellent. Um, sorry for that, guys. There was a, a glitch in the connection, but we're back. So I, I was thinking, I, I, I'm pretty sure I, the last, uh, before I dropped off, I was busy with discussing the commercial segment and the fact that, sorry, I was actually on the previous page, the commun communal segment and the fact that most of the efforts in the communal segment is simply to improve their understanding of all the basic aspects of animal husbandry and herd and breed management uh, not really breed management, herd management, and good herd management practices. And as you can see, as we move on to the segments, the emerging sector and the commercial sector, we actually move on. And when we get to the stud sector, we actually intend to try and get some of those, if not all of those stud breeders, included into the BGP process. So long and short, KYD is a, an approach where we recognize four segments in the emerging sector. And instead of trying to address everybody as if it's the same, we say, no, let's focus on relevant activities applicable for the sector. And if we then jump to what does that mean in terms of BGP interventions, then on the left hand side, again, we start off with BGP generating good quality phenotype data, but then we suddenly see that KYD genomics, in the first instance, for many of those segments, will focus on parentage and breed composition. And on the right hand side, on the top, you can see it focuses on those four animals, elements of animal husbandry and herd management. And for each one of those segments, we've then identified different strategies, different elements of the, uh, of the, the strategies. Uh, and they, all of them can tap out of the genomic reference population at the bottom. And you will see that the stud breeders may add to the rest tap from, but the stud breeders, you will see it's got a dotted line with two arrows on heads on both sides, 
suggesting that for the stud breeders in the emerging sector, we believe they will be able to add to the genomic reference population, whereas the other three segments will be recipients of the value we create in the genomic reference population. And that is just the high level picture of the differentiation of how does genomics fit into that space. Then we have also uh, established, and this is just a high level summary, there's a lot of detail behind these graphs, but the bottom line is we've looked at each one of the four sectors and we've said, how do we, how will we measure our technology adoption and the adoption growth paths for each one of these sectors over time? And we have obviously developed those growth paths based on the technology elements that we've identified that is applicable to each segment. It's not a one shoe fits all approach, it cannot be. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that's the end of my story. So I hope you've got a bit of a glimpse of, in the one instance, BGP is a, a BGP2, as le at least as far as the LRF breed societies is concerned, is an extremely focused effort, focused on data quality. And once we've got that right, genotyping volumes based on good data quality on the one hand, and the second significant focus is, how do we start involving ourselves and involving the emerging sector into this program of ours. BGP is a journey. We believe it's a journey that will hopefully last for several rounds to come. And as we plan it today, more than a decade to come, um, it's not something that is achieved overnight. And that's my story. Thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'll gladly try and take them. Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, oh, there's one. Um, Francois, you can ask your questions. Um, you can just unmute yourself. Okay. I'm going to ask Grace, we would like to see PowerPoint presentation as well as possible. The whole screen will be available on our YouTube channel, on the LRF. It's a YouTube channel, so you can see it there. Good, bye, thank you very much. Let's see. Any other questions? Yes, Francois, if you have any questions, then it's very clear that I've got the whole thing in the pot or I've got the old ones. Okay, I think you have the goal to get the die doel bereik en dit was um, baie insiggerend en ja, verstaan precies hoe om contemporaire groepe saam te stel wat, wat so belangrike component is vir dierentering en ja, dit is een van, van die goed wat hulle uit die lezing kan neem is, is dit en goeie data. Dolg? Ik wil net vertellen dat het was bijna goed geweest. Dank je. Dat is heel dol. Jij nog een vraag? Pieter? Um, ja, ik wil thuis de stelling net niet onverifieerd met respect naar thuis. Um, die stelling wat je gemaakt hebt dat. Um, Die accuratheid van data opname is meer belangrijk als die volume wat ik mee werk in die, in die verwijzingspopulatie. Um, als ik kijk naar de gecombineerde grafiek wat je voor ons gegeven dan, dan is het niet altijd maar de waarheid niet. Want uh, volgens Goddard en, en die andere man wat zijn naam daar staan, hoe meer inlichting ik heb van een uh, verwijzingspopulatie, hoe meer accuraat gaan mijn genetische of mijn genotyping inlichting op de einde van die dag. Weer. So, uh, 
is my stelling, ek mag dat verkeerd wees, ek wil net weet of, of jy dit in die sin sien. Ik sê ja, um, ek, ek gaan um, uh, met respect met jou verskil, en kom ek verduidelik hoekom. As ek, um, kom ons vat een praktische voorbeeld, en ek probeer glad nie enig iemand daarna kom nie, dit is een voorbeeld. Indien ons um, in een Wagyu populatie, een verwijzingspopulatie het van 10.000 rekords, wat groot is, en die 10.000 rekords het al die data in, wat jy moendlik kan meet, vir vleeskwaliteit en alles wat daarmee saamgaan, maar as geen data oor enige vrugbaarheids eigenskap nie, dan gaan hulle kan baie goeie genomische waarde kry uit die vleeskwaliteit, maar min genetische waarde of geen uit vir vrugbaarheid. En die suivere voorbeeld, ek is glad nie bezig om te sê, dit is wat bezig is om te gebeur nie, ek probeer net my stelling te uh, ondersteun. As die selle genootskap vastgesteek het en gesê het, ek maak 2000 rekords by mekaar. En die 2000 rekords is werkelijk waar total testing wat al die eigenskappe soos bespreek op die total testing blad, blad sy ver, vervat. Dan denk ek gaan hulle beter afwees. Want dan sit jy met een gebalanceerde prentjie en jy kan verder voor en toe gaan. By die tyd wat jy dit geskep het, kan jy begin focus. Maar voordat jy nie die fondamente geleed, is het gevaarlik om te sê, ek gaan genomiese profiele skep van dieren wat beperkte fenotypiese data het. En dit is die onderliggende logika van my stelling. Maar ek luister graag na Mike Bradfield of Isan of enig iemand anders sy interpretatie in die verband. Dit bly my interpretatie alleen. Dank okay. Wat ek nie dalk sal wil noem, is dat wanneer ons praat van een verwijsingspopulatie, praat ons eindelijk van een verwijsingspopulatie per eigenskap. So jy moet een verwijsingspopulatie technisch, of dit kan alles in een wees, as jy die total testing het, en alles word op die selle dieren gemeet, maar andersens as jy dan nou net op sekere dieren um, vrugbaarheidseigenskappe meet, dan gaan hulle saam die vrugbaarheids um, verwijsingspopulatie vorm, en ander dalk die karkaspopulatie. Maar dan moet jy vir elkeen van die, die hoeveelheid um, dieren in jou verwijsingspopulatie hee, met beide die, die fenotype en die genotype. So, ons moet besef dat het eindelijk per eigenskap is. Die... Ek baie goed bestel, dankie Isan. Enige ander vraag? Ek ken nie interessant. Dat is enig. Ek kan nie vijf 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 geen ander vraag is nie, dan kunnen ons die, die vergadering hier um, stop. Baie dankie vir allemaal sy, sy inzette en dat jylle deel geneem het. En dan ons, ek is nie 100% seker wanneer ons volgende lezing is nie, um, maar Ja, jullie sal dit sien op ons sociale media platforms en ja, dan kan jullie daarvoor ook registreer. Baie dankie, dan praat ons weer. Lekke dag vir allemaal. Dankie, mooi dag, tot ziens.